Um, thank you for having me. I already heard uh, quite a few uh, uh, questions on insect composition, so that's very nice. I also heard um, a more elaborate story about uh, a few sheets that I have in mind, so I will uh, go through those uh, quickly. But let's uh, start with a, uh, a round of uh, introduction. Uh, of course, Louis already uh, uh, said a bit about uh, me. He, he uh, gave the, the more formal introduction. Um, I did indeed uh, do animal nutrition in uh, Wageningen University. My name is Dennis Odings, which are both very difficult to pronounce for Spanish speakers and actually for most people, I would say. Um, so I am an animal nutritionist. Uh, you might also say that I'm an entomologist. I did my PhD on insects as food and feed. That is, um, by then the to topic was quite, uh, quite uh, uh, well, small, well, broad, so there were not so many subtopics. So I looked at uh, nutrient composition and the environmental impact of insect production systems. And I also continued on that, looking uh, more into detail on how to produce insects and what their composition was. And more recently, I'm, I've been working on the nutrient requirements of insects. Um, the idea was that it doesn't really matter so much whether you are working on the composition of insects for human consumption, for lizard consumption, or for uh, production animals, and indeed also not for amphibians. So what I will be talking about today is primarily focused on what is in these insects. And when I talk about insects, then I'm talking about a pretty large group. Uh, often people consider that similar to, uh, to amphibians as, uh, well, just one, uh, uh, one group of animals, which is very similar. But in reality, the, the group of insects is uh, extremely large. We, uh, we think there are about 5.5 million species. And about, about 1 million of those have currently been described. So there is a, a, a large, there's a large uh, diversity uh, within that group, as you might expect from the number of species. And there's a lot of species that we actually do not even know. If you compare it to uh, the number of mammals, it's a, a group that we are a bit more familiar with, then there are 5,500 species of mammals. So you could say it's about 1,000 times as many species of insects as there are mammals. Um, so large group and very diverse. And for this talk, actually, it's not just about uh, uh, insects. Also, other arthropods are, of course, relevant to feed amphibians. So I would talk about uh, I could talk about mites as well, which I will not. Um, but I will have some springtails in here specifically for the, the smaller uh, frogs that uh, would fall under your interest. Okay, if I talk about nutritional content, then if we talk about insects as a whole group, then there's a very extreme variation. So the crude protein content is somewhere between 7.5 to 91% on a dry matter basis. So if you take an insect, you take all the water out, and you determine the, the crude protein content, so actually the nitrogen content, then you would get a value between 7.5 and 91, which is either very, very low or very, very high. If you want to have a ballpark figure, so have a bit of an idea what you would expect in an unknown insect, then about 60% on a crude protein basis, would, on a dry matter basis, would be fitting. The other major component in uh, insects is fat. And again, there you see a very large variation. So the crude fat content can be anywhere between 3.3 and 64% on a dry matter basis. Also here, a ballpark figure would be 20 to 30% crude fat. But this can uh, uh, differ quite a lot uh, between species and also based on other uh, uh, elements, which I will discuss later in this, uh, in this talk. So, we talk about uh, uh, nutritional value here of insects, or at least that is often what people ask about. And to explain the concept of nutritional value, well, you can look at the chemical composition of an animal, so the nutrient content, what is actually in there. So you dry it, you, uh, you grind it, and then you do certain analysis to figure out what it is. 
that's by itself interesting and that will be the primary focus of this talk but also digestibility and bioavailability are concepts that come into play so you can ingest something but that does not mean that it has a nutritional value for you and yeah, maybe a, a, a big roll of uh, a big uh, calcium stone would be a good example if you cannot digest it or not digest it fully then you cannot use these uh, these nutrients so very well so ingest uh, we, we look at ingestion but not so much at digestion and then there's the next term that is of relevant that's that's the nutrient requirements so what does an animal actually need to build its body in a uh, in a good way uh, which building blocks are needed for amphibians i am not sure if there are really decent studies that have looked into this it's a fairly difficult uh, uh, topic by itself, and even for production animals, there are still some uh, some things that uh, need to be developed further. For humans, there are still some uh, discoveries being made, and I would imagine that if you are looking for a, a Mantella species or, uh, well, actually most species of amphibians, these, this data is simply not available. But we will focus now primarily on chemical composition. So what is actually inside these invertebrates? What is inside these insects? Um, there's a study that I did in 2015. There was actually a reaction on the study on uh, uh, UV requirements or vitamin D requirements of prone beta dragons. A reviewer asked me, so you say that these values are natural values, but uh, how do you know? And we went to Australia to find some free living, free roaming uh, beta dragons, took some blood samples and tried to figure out what normal vitamin D values were. And while we were there, we thought, well, we can have a look around. We can see what else we can find. And if you would find the animals, then at certain places, there would be some plants growing. And there would be some insects walking around. And what we did is we actually did some stomach flushings. So you put some water in these bearded dragons, get out what they have eaten, put it in a, a jar, freeze that, and we took that home. We had then a student uh, looking into uh, which animals were actually in there, which plants were in there, and we had some chemical analysis done on these. So in that way, we could get a bit of an idea on uh, what, a, what they were actually eating in the wild. And what we found was uh, a certain termite species being present there and some locust being present there. And if you look at these axes, then you see the uh the crude fat content in red and the crude protein content in green so these were the animals that we found in the wild but termites are not being produced in any relevant numbers within uh well the western world i would say uh, at least not in, uh, as a production animal and also the local species that we have here are a little bit different than the ones that are walking around there but what we did is we looked at the chemical composition and based on that, you could see that the locusts, the migratory locusts that we have here in Europe are not so very different from the locust species that they were consuming in Australia. And if you then look at the composition of the termites that they were consuming, then you can see a, a fairly low protein content and a fairly high fat content, which is not that dissimilar from the yellow mealworm which we can buy here without any problems. So in order to create a diet that fits to the requirements of that specific species, you can look at the natural diets and then try to find species that uh, fit to that. And it gives you a bit of an idea on what you would need. Now I said we did this with uh, stomach flushings. Um, I have heard that some people have worked uh, on this for frogs as well but um, I don't know how widespread that is, and I have not been able to, uh, uh, just before this meeting, find the most relevant information for that. You can expect that this is uh, very species-specific, so it cannot easily be extrapolated to other species. 
What we also learned in uh, 2015 while walking through the desert is that the termites that we saw that were quite uh, uh, well were, were all over the place more or less and were a very large part of the diet of these bearded dragons only came after the first rains of the season came. So what that did is it uh, skewed our data a lot. Based on the, the few weeks of sampling, we would think that uh, say 40% on a dry matter basis of that diet consists of termites, but for the other say uh, 48 to 50 weeks per, of the year, these termites would not be out, they would not be swarming, and therefore they would not be part of the diet. So that is something to take into account. If you do come across data from uh, animals in the wild, what they consume, insects and other arthropods are often only seasonally available. So the moment of sampling can have a large effect on the, the interpretation of the data and therefore on the, the uh, suggested nutrient intake. Uh, this is what I explained. So the, the locusts are fairly similar to the migratory locusts and also to the house crickets and the mealworms and the termites were very similar as well. When we talk about either reptiles or amphibians, then there are some nutritional attention points. Omega-3 fatty acids would be a, a thing that uh, I would want to put forward. Um, the feed that we feed insects being produced is often fairly low in omega-3 fatty acids whereas they might come across these in uh, nature a bit more. Calcium has been mentioned a few times and I will uh, get back to that uh, again as well. Um, it is a very important uh, nutrient and I, I think there will be a lot to discover on that topic still, especially for amphibians and also for reptiles, actually for most insectivores. Then vitamin A in carotenoids is a, an important one and the previous speaker clearly uh, suggested uh, uh, some other benefits than just the nutritional aspects of these uh, carotenoids. Vitamin D is a very interesting one, I would say as well. I've, I've done some work on that for reptiles, but also on insects and we'll see uh, some data on that later on. And also vitamin E is something that uh, I think deserves some attention. And I think that Andrea also mentioned that. So I'm, I'm very happy that we have a, a more or less uh, similar shortlist. Okay, so what determines the composition of an insect? Well, of course, species is a very important determinant there. So different species have different nutrient profiles, but that is not all. Also the life stage is uh, very important. So I was, was very happy to hear about uh, the question on the pinheads. That doesn't mean I can show you a lot of data on that, but indeed the stage of development can have a, a large impact on the composition of that species. So um, crickets might not be crickets, but young crickets are not the same as all the crickets. Diet is, uh, I would say, an, a, the most important determining factor. I will show you some uh, examples of what you can uh, reach by altering the diet and the composition of the insect itself. Also the environment plays a role, so how do you rear the insects? And lastly, also gender plays a role, which I will also show you some examples of. So crickets are crickets. Um, uh, the previous speaker already uh, said the same, that uh, there are some differences, but if I look at these four cricket species, so we have the house cricket here, the banded cricket, the Jamaican field cricket, and the two-spotted field cricket. That's the one that came out best in the previous uh, uh, talk. Then actually the crude protein content is not so very different. It's slightly below uh, 60% on a dry matter basis. So you might say that, yes, indeed, crickets are crickets. But when you start looking at the same species uh, and then at the fat content, then there's actually quite some difference. There's a much lower fat content in the house cricket, whereas the banded crickets have a far higher fat, uh, uh, fat content. Now, the in interesting part of this, uh, this study is that these four species were all taken as uh, pinhead crickets. They were then uh, set up in exactly the same way on the same climate conditions, provided with the same feed and the same feeding regime. So what you see is a difference of a plus 50% from 22 to 33, 
uh, in the fat content, whereas all other things are the same. So crickets are not crickets. Even within this uh, group of species, there can be very large differences, even with all other aspects being exactly the same. If you look at the mineral content, then it's uh, you can also see some uh, large differences there. And you can see that the iron and zinc content of the house cricket, so the black bars, is far higher than for the other three species that we analyzed. Um, for copper, that is not the case. There is quite similar, and actually the banded crickets have a higher copper content. And for manganese, you might say that it is a little bit higher than the rest, but not so clear, not so extreme as for the iron and zinc. So the accumulation patterns of uh, these insects are also different. You can talk about uh, species, but you can also talk about strains. Um, here you see the silkworm bombix mori, and here you can see the pupae uh, or the, the cocoons uh, of this species. And as you can see, they were selected for silk, so there are very different uh, colorations available. And these colorations, uh, similar to the frogs that we spoke about before, are made by uh, carotenoids. Due to the selection on uh, the certain colors, there were some strains developed, the so-called white polyhybrid, because white silk is sometimes better than golden or yellowish silk. And what you then can see is that if you give them different feeds, you compare the strains, that there are differences between the strains, which are actually huge. You can see it here, for instance, that the amount of carotenoids is about double uh, between the two strains. So the golden Istari strain, in this case, the one that accumulates the golden color, of course, has a far higher carotenoid content than the other one. Um, so even within a species, there can be large differences in accumulation patterns, which are uh, due to the rare medium, but also by strain and, of course, the interaction between these two. So even the strain of insect species that you are rearing can have a difference on the, uh, uh, the nutritional outcome of that species. If you want to adapt the composition of an, uh, an insect, uh, the house cricket here as an example, but it's for most species, then you can do that by changing the long-term diets by gut loading or providing a supplement. So the long-term diet is just how you rear the animal. Gut loading is uh, uh, how you fill the inner tube, I would say. That can be uh, up to 10% of the dry matter, so it can be a, a fairly large uh, effect. And then there's the supplement that then can be coated on the outside, which is, of course, also a way to adapt the composition and is used primarily um, for calcium and uh, vitamin supplements. So there are different, uh, uh, different nutrients that you can adapt by uh, different approaches on the nutrition or the outside of the feeder insect. If I look at the uh, at dietary effects, then those can differ over species and they can be fairly large. Here you see a larvae of the black soldier fly that was uh, provided with different diets, which you can see by the different depictions here. And what you can see is that the total fatty acid content goes from about 20 to almost 40%. So that's a relatively large difference. Whereas the protein content is somewhere in between 35 and 45, so not as large a difference. But you can see that there can be a large spread within the species depending on the diet they were provided. So each icon that you see here uh, that, that differs is a different uh, diet. Here we see the same story, so uh, different icons are different diets. And we see mealworms without and those supplemented with carrots. And what you then can see is that the fat content is uh, somewhere between uh, 20 and 40 percent on the diet supplemented with carrots. It's slightly less uh, white here. Interesting detail is that these seemingly outliers were the control diet of the mealworms that we utilized 
and in the rearing system they were actually provided with uh, carrots so if you buy them commercially from that supplier then this is the composition that you would expect to have the bandwidth of the protein content is not so wide 45 to 55 percent for actually all samples that we analyzed and then we come to the argentinian cockroach which is uh, well you can see that uh, the, there's a big range here right so you can see the 65 to 75 percent crew protein here then going down going down and here's another group at about 35 percent of 35 percent of the dry matter basis uh, regarding crew protein and the fat content is also highly different between uh, well say 15 to 20 for most diets but up to 40 percent on the high fat diet in this case so a very large spread can be attained by giving this species a different diet here you can see all the different uh, diets combined so you can get a nice range of different compositions uh, regarding crude protein and fat content uh, for these four species and the interesting part is that if you look at the outliers or the, the most extreme uh, composition then they are from the same species uh, indicating that especially this species has a very high plasticity in the in the composition this also allows you to formulate diets that are more fitting to the requirements of the target animal assuming that you would know these targets so you can then adapt the feed of the insect in order to provide the nutrients that would be required by the consuming species there are also some clear differences based on species uh, regarding uh, between species so the black soldier fly is well known to have a fairly high lauric acid content so the black, eh, these are in red and the big red bar here is absent in the other three species so you can recognize that quite well what you might also see is that there's the omega-6 fatty acids here which are uh, uh, more present in house crickets than in the other species and especially the black soldier fly larvae and the argentinian cockroaches were fairly low in these omega-6 fatty acids now you also see these arrow bars and these arrow bars are actually because of the uh, the mixing of the the diets in this uh, uh, in this graph so the bigger the arrow bar is the higher the flexibility of this uh, fatty acids within the diet and you can see here's a fairly large one which has to do with uh, the de novo synthesis of this species and also for the omega-6 fatty acids which were uh, present in very different concentrations within the diet you can see that you can have a large variation there the omega-3 fatty acids were fairly uh, in, in fairly low uh, quantities available from these insects on the diets that we tested if you want uh, the full details i can share them uh, later on um, but that does not need to be the case we did a study a few years later in which we look at uh, omega-6 to omega-3 ratio and we had house crickets in there uh, the lesser mealworm and black soldier fly larvae again and you can see the first bar which is uh, the control diet so if you give them a normal diet then this is more or less the ratio that you can expect it was very high for the uh, the house cricket a little bit lower for the other two but still a lot above the dotted line and this dotted line is the uh, is at five which is supposedly the optimal level for human health okay so what we did is we uh, included flaxseed oil in their diet so we added one percent two percent or four percent same here same here to their diet and you can see that the ratios improved a lot so if you want to reach the dotted line then actually you can do that quite quite easily so you can do that quite easily by adding well one one and a half percent of flaxseed oil to your uh, to your diet and then you can get that ratio down a lot so you can actually uh, alter the fatty acid composition of these insects quite well by by changing the dietary composition uh, that they receive 
Now, we looked at the different fatty acids that were being produced there, and we put in uh, so-called ALA, it's a C18, it's an 18 carbon uh, length fatty acid. But unfortunately, we were not able to find elongation to uh, C20. So we do not see the more interesting uh, fatty acids being synthesized by these uh, species. So not uh, EPA or DHA, which is a bit of a shame because if you look at human health and those are actually the ones that we want most. These are the ones that we would else need to form ourselves and that's not a very e efficient process. Um, so getting those uh, in the, the diet of the insectivores is a little bit tricky, at least uh, by using C18 as a starting point. But there are more feeder animals that you can use for, uh, uh, for reptiles and for amphibians. Um, I have some of these myself for Somia. I use them for the, the few frogs that I have at home. And they are apparently a very interesting species. They are very easy to cultivate, as you will probably know. And they can also be uh, uh, provided with a wide variety of diets. So a study done by Chamberlain et al. in 2005 looked at the uh, provision of uh, uh, certain fungi, nematodes, and you can see some depictions here, corn or elder. And what they found was uh, the, that the total abundance of C20 uh, PUFA, so EPA, uh, so EPA, for instance, was far higher uh, if you provided them with these nematodes. So the presence of nematodes in the rearing of Fosomia uh, leads to a different trophic uh, uh, cascade. The nematodes can eat on bacteria in that rearing system, uh, accumulate the C20, and then provide that to the Fosomia in order for them to have a higher concentration as well. And I must say that 18.8% uh, 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 of total fatty acids is a very very high concentration so that makes these very little guys a very interesting source of c20 PFAS. so to summarize the, the the part on fatty acids there's a big difference between the different species the diet plays a very important role you can enrich them with omega-3 fatty acids if you include that in the diet uh, but as far as I've been able to, uh, to find, there is no or at least very limited uh, uh, elongation of C18 to C20 uh, PUFAS. So you would need to add uh, an extra step if that would be a uh, goal. Um, then life stage differences. I know that these species uh, might be a little bit big for the uh, for most amphibians, but of course, if you look at the, the, the mountain chicken frog, then this could be a potential source of uh, feed as well. Here we see two species, Cystoseca gregaria, which is the desert locust, and the migratory locust, Locusta migratoria. You can see the penultimate ones depicted here, and the adult ones here and here you can see some of the omega-3 fatty uh, om uh, omega-9 omega-6 and omega-3 fatty acids there seems to be a bit of a difference between the the individuals and there seems to be a certain well pattern you might say but the most interesting is the absence of the two bars here or at least that's what i find fascinating so when i saw the data pass by I, I double checked it to figure out is this an artifact I have, have samples been uh, mixed up is there something else going on but apparently the omega-3 fatty acids present here in the penultimate locusts is no longer present in the adults so when they uh, become adult get their wings then they apparently lose the ALA that they had accumulated another level of uh, about 10 percent that's actually quite a bit uh, why that is i am afraid i still do not know but it does mean that if you are feeding uh, larger insectivores 
then you might want to use the slightly smaller penultimate ones uh, instead of the adult ones if you want to have a higher intake of omega-3 fatty acids. Yeah, this is this is what I have from uh, crickets. Uh, getting back to the, the earlier question on pinhead crickets. Um, this is not my own uh, data. It was uh, uh, provided to me by Mark Finke. And what you can uh, uh, can see here is the protein content of these house crickets uh, from stage two, four, five, seven, eight, and after laying eggs. And what you see is that it slowly goes down a little bit and then reaching adulthood, it goes up. And after egg laying, it goes up further. That coincides with the fat itself, which slowly accumulates just before they become adult and then it goes down. What you will often see is that uh, protein and fat, if uh, seen uh, as the uh, concentration, um, are uh, moving the opposite way. So if protein content goes up, then fat content goes down. If fat content goes up, then fat, uh, uh, protein concentration goes down. Why? The total is 100%. And where there is fat, there is no protein. Where there's protein, there is no fat. What is something that I found an interesting uh, difference is the vitamin E content, which was fairly high at stage two. So that's not, not the, 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 the real pinheads. It's uh, a slightly uh, larger size, but still very suitable for most uh, uh, smaller amphibians, I would say. And it goes down very rapidly when they go to development stage four. So when they become, uh, well, mid-sized crickets. So there can be a large difference there. And also the ash content seems to be going down quite a bit in that first step. So the very small crickets seemingly have a higher ash content, therefore a higher mineral content, and a far higher vitamin E content, which was probably delivered by the adults uh, to the egg. Uh, there is indeed a big challenge in doing such analysis. You really need to have quite some samples. Um, myself, I work in a lab of animal nutrition, and uh, next to me, there are people working with cows and with pigs. And when I ask the lab if they can do an analysis, they yeah, sure they can. Um, how much sample would you need? Ah, not so much, just two kilograms, which is a normal uh, amount. If you are feeding cattle, then getting two kilograms of their feed is not such a thing. But if you need two kilograms of pinhead crickets, that's, that is a thing. Now, of course, the sample amounts can go down, but even if you only need say 30 grams of fresh material, so you have 10 grams of dry material, that is still a lot in the world of pinhead crickets. During my period in the St. Louis Zoo, I decided on working with fruit flies. And let me just say, it was challenging to gather sufficient uh, material for the uh, chemical analysis uh, in the end. There are more factors that are uh, of relevance, and that's the environment. So the rearing temperature of the insects can have an effect, humidity can have an effect, and also light conditions can have an effect on the, uh, the composition of the feeder insects. So to give a few examples, here are some bean weevils, also uh, sometimes used as amphibian food. My animals are not so very keen on those, but perhaps they are the, the old ones out. And if you look at the rearing temperature, then we see the males and the females being separated in the left and the right panel, 20 and 30 degrees, 20 and 30 degrees. So for the protein, it seems that uh, at a higher temperature, there's a bit more protein there. Then you would normally expect that the fat content is slightly lower, but that does not seem to be the case. The females have a fairly uh, similar fat content at 20 and 30 degrees, <clears throat> and at, uh, uh, for the males, that is slightly different. They have a slightly lower fat content, as you would expect, uh, at the higher temperature. Also clear is that the females have more fat than the males, which is a uh, uh, not so strange effect, as the females need more lipids in order to build their eggs and to have sufficient offspring. <clears throat> 
if you are feeding these bean weevils and you are just putting in uh, uh, 200 specimens to uh, feed a colony, then these differences are maybe not so important uh, between the genders. And I will get back to that later on in which instances that they can actually be very important. Here's an example of the two spotted crickets. Um, also reared at uh, two different temperatures, 20 degrees and 27 degrees. Here are the females and here are the males. And what you see here is the protein content and the white bar is the lipid content. So if you look uh, within the females, the lipid content of uh, uh, females at 27 degrees is higher than that of uh, females at 20 degrees. And a similar but less pronounced difference can be found for males. 20 degrees uh, has a little bit less lipids than at 27 degrees. And then the protein content is the complementary part. So more lipids means less protein. If you look at, if you would look at these animals in their rearing system and you would keep them at a continuous 20 degrees, then you would probably be saying that they are not doing so very, very well because this animal is trying to just build a body and be very happy and productive. Um, the ones that are being produced at 27 degrees will be doing better. They will have a higher fat content because they were accumulated, uh, able to accumulate enough energy, which you will see back in the growth and the development and in the reproduction. So if you are, rearing an insect then you have to think about you do you want the rearing itself to be as effective and efficient as possible or are you really producing for the amphibians that will be uh, eating on this feeding on this because then you will need to have some uh, differences in your rearing system which might not be optimal for the insect but might be uh, uh, optimal for the, uh, the the consumer of that insect this is a study that I came across uh, very recently. It is also again with uh, two spotted uh, crickets and they were trying to look at the effect of UVB on the composition, especially on vitamin D content. They were not able to find any effect, but they looked much further and that was very, very interesting because sometimes if you do some chemical analysis, you can make sense of uh, uh, other things that you might not have been looking for, but are very, very interesting. What you see here are females and males, and in this case, it's the calcium panel for those without UV and those with UV. And what you see is that the red boxes of the females is far higher than that of the males. Um, so that means uh, it's a concentration, milligrams uh, per kilogram of dry matter, so PPMs, that females have far more calcium than males. For copper, it's exactly the other way around. The males have a far higher co copper content than the females, irrespective of irradiation. Well, there's a difference in dry mass, but of course you would have seen that already that the females get bigger than the males, so that's not so exciting. But also for certain other elements here, uh, potassium, uh, yeah, potassium, you can see that the females are richer, magnesium, same story, phosphorus, also same story, but then we are looking at uh, sulfide, then that is no longer the case. And also for zinc, the males have a higher content. So by feeding males or females exclusively, you would be giving a different diet. Um, I myself have some, uh, some geckos at home. And I, when I take my crickets, I put them in a box, I put some supplement on there. And then I look at the size of the cricket and feed that to uh, the gecko. But the smaller animals, are then provided with primarily males, whereas the larger animals are provided with primarily females because females simply get bigger. So you get a bias in what you uh, provide. The concentration of the minerals that you think you are providing would be somewhere in the middle, but actually the smaller animals are provided with much less calcium than the bigger animals. So if you are 
actually feeding single feeder animals to uh, your, uh, your stock, to your amphibians, then you need to be aware of differences between gender and maybe you need to mix it up a little bit so that you give both males and females to uh, specific uh, specimens. Carotenoids we spoke about uh, a little bit. Did somebody look into that? Yeah. Um, here you can see beta carotene. And these are all samples from wild caught insects. Also provided, the graph is provided by Mark Finke again. And you can see very large differences here. So, for instance, if you look at the grasshoppers, then there's a lot of beta carotene here, actually 240, whereas this axis stops at 35. And the same is true for these dragonflies, apparently. Arms, not so much, scarab beetles, etc. The primary function of this graph is to show you that there is quite some variation uh, within the wild caught insects. Now, when you go to the commercially raised ones, then there are labels here, but you do not see any real uh, data. So what that means is that these commercially available uh, mealworms, waxworms, black solidifying larvae, roaches, superworms, and crickets did not contain any relevant amount of beta carotene, unless, and I do not have any stock in this uh, company, they were provided with the so-called Vitabug supplement. In short, if you give these insects, and uh, the commercially produced ones, a source of beta carotene, then they will have some beta carotene in there. And if that is something that you want to get into the, the, the amphibian that you're raising or the reptile that you're raising, then you need to make sure that there is sufficient intake of the right carotenoids by the insects. So make sure it's part of the diet and uh, adding it on a longer term can have higher benefits than on a shorter term. This was on beta, uh, beta carotenoids, but beta, beta carotene, uh, but there are many more carotenoids of potential uh, relevance. And here I saw more data. And again, it, it's not really about which animal has what, it's about the, the big difference that you can see within the group that was analyzed. So for instance, here you have three beetle species, some have different carotenoids in there, some did not have any detectable carotenoids. If you start looking over groups, then you will see certain carotenoids being more present, so beta carotene in uh, this case being the dark blue ones, but then there's a contact something in these two specimens, but not in the third. Here, a lot of crack, uh, carotenoids in the dragonfly, but not so much uh, of the contact something in there. So the I think the, the, the message here is that there are differences in wild insects by getting a, a complete diet from different species, you can, uh, the, the animal can uh, attain these different carotenoids. What we give our animals in captivity uh, limits them in some way. So we need to make sure that we provide carotenoids to the diet of the uh, produced insects in order to get these uh, carotenoids in, uh, in the amphibians or reptiles that we are trying to keep and breed. Um, I am not going to deal with this in great detail because it has already been uh, talked about in, uh, uh, by our previous speaker. So providing carotenoids at a certain moment can be very important. Same for this slide. Um, I, I must admit that I find these pictures very interesting uh, uh, to show still. I don't think they were in the last uh, talk. So I will tell you a little bit about what they did. So you have a control with house crickets. Uh, then there's uh, beta carotene injected in house crickets. And then there's a mixture of different uh, carotenoids uh, provided uh, to this animal. And clearly you can see there's there seems to be a bit of a difference here, but clearly the mixed carotenoids led to uh, uh, the tomato frog looking much more like a tomato frog. So there can be a benefit of getting different carotenoids in the diet of 
insects or well in this case injecting them in order to actually uh, get the coloration of the animals um, uh, up but it's not just about uh, carotenoids here you can also see uh, retinol in the graph and again you see the same treatments as before i'm not sure about these post hoc tests though uh, because they seem to indicate no difference i don't think so what i see in this data based on the error bars and the, the averages is that the control has some retinol the difference uh, with the beta carotene is a little bit higher so there was some accumulation in the control from start to later on this was more when beta carotene was supplemented and when a mixture was provided it's even more clear um, which by itself is an indirect uh, indication that uh, this species is able to uh, synthesize retinol from these carotenoids, which is, uh, in some cases, still seems to be uh, uh, under debate. Um, okay, so why carotenoids in frog diets? Well, I think from uh, these slides, but especially from the previous speaker, that has become quite clear. Vitamin E was also mentioned uh, earlier on, and again, you see a similar story as with the uh, carotenoid uh, data that I showed before. Here you can see some wild-caught animals, some wild-caught uh, insects being uh, that have been analyzed. Surely there are some that are fairly low in vitamin E, but some are very, very high. And then when you start looking at the commercially produced uh, insect species, they are fairly low in vitamin E probably because the diet they received was never optimized for uh, them being the source of feed. However, if you provide them with a diet that is rich in vitamin E, then you can get a far higher uh, concentration in these insects and therefore provide more vitamin E to the uh, animal consuming this, uh, these insects. So it is possible to enrich uh, these insects with vitamin E by providing it through the diet. Yeah, vitamin D, I think the, the, the cascade itself has been uh, uh, talked about quite a bit already as well, uh, if I uh, got it right from the previous speakers. So very briefly, sunlight hits, hits a certain precursor, 78C. Vitamin D is made in the skin, we're talking humans here, which goes to the liver, it gets hydroxylated, moves to the kidney and to some other tissues and then it gets hydroxylated again to the biologically active form. Important for calcium absorption, so that's a, a very important uh, part, but uh, there are many more functions of vitamin D known as well. Of course, you can also just take it in dietarily and then it also enters the bloodstream after being uh, digested and it is hydroxylated also in the liver, etc. So then it uh, continues as well. Um, the UVB radiation uh, works as follows. It converts the precursor to pre-vitamin D, which then with a little bit of heat, oh, still some touch in there, is converted to vitamin D. But if there is prolonged irradiation, then tachysterol or lumisterol can also be formed. So there's a, 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 a fail-safe system there to not get produce too much vitamin D but isomers can be produced there. So that's the, the basics. The UV light that is needed for that, which is also the reason why I spoke about uh, which wavelengths are important for the, the carotenoid conversion, um, are within the UVB range. So there's the sun that has uh, some heat coming from it, some visible light, some UVA. I could imagine that there's an interaction with carotenoids with UVA and there's some UVB which can synthesize, can help with the synthesis of vitamin D. UVC is the bad UV, you don't want that, it's filtered out by the ozone layer and bad quality lamps can emit some of that. So be a little bit cautious if you use uh, UV lamps that you take the right ones that you do not have any UVC coming from there. Yeah, so that's the conversion pathway. And if we look at uh, humans, then this is actually how we get our vitamin D. That is not the same for all species, though. If we look at uh, vitamin D in frogs, then 
a few studies have been uh, been done uh, on this project by uh, on this topic by now in general it seems that insects are low in vitamin d um, but that does not necessarily have to be the case um, we will look at that in a few, a few slides from here what i do think is that if you use a supplement with vitamin D, it's very different, it's very difficult to actually know how much that you are feeding. So you have your little frog, you have your fruit flies, you cover them with the supplement of which you hope that it contains the amount of vitamin D that it says on the outside, because else you would have to do the analysis. And then you are not so completely sure how much of this supplement is on the fruit by the moment that it goes into uh, the, the the tank or if you're keeping the animal and how much is still on there by the time that the uh, insect is being consumed uh, is also not known so knowing how much you're really giving is tricky at best uvb has been suggested to be suitable for frogs as well but i'm I'm seeing uh, uh, different stories there, which might have to do with uh, uh, the source of light being utilized. But I said there's a uh, self-limiting uh, uh, aspect for the biosynthesis. There is some risk for uh, short wave UV, but there is a study indicating that this uh, Bombina orientalis, uh, I'm looking for the English name, but I can't find it now, by pot can have a small increase in vitamin d concentrations in the blood that is but this is not really a lot uh, and the question is how significant is this um, for the animal itself does it really make a difference or does the 74 animals actually indicate that uh, it accumulates it accumulates quite efficiently from their diet um, that is a question that is open in my world, and I would like to, I would love to debate on that later on. Here is a, a study of uh, the uh, mountain chicken frog, one that was uh, provided with no UV, and the picture was taken at five months of age. And then for another specimen, six months without, and then two months with uh, UVB then you can actually see that the calcification here is much more clear. So then the question is, is there a difference between specimens uh, per se, or has the calcification process uh, been facilitated with just these two months of uh, UV after six months without? Deformities will, uh, will still stay. So if an animal has deformities, it's difficult, if not impossible, to correct that uh, fully by uh, UVB, but there does seem to be reason to think that in this, uh, in this specimen or in this species, provision of UVB is relevant to get uh, a decent vitamin D status in the animal and therefore get uh, good bone calcification. But these are not the only specimens that can make uh, vitamin D. Also, some insect species seem to be able to do so. So a study that we did with migratory locusts, house crickets, yellow mealworms, and black soldier fly larvae looked at animals being uh, uh, exposed, black bars, or unexposed to uh, UVB. And what you can deduct from this, uh, this first panel is that there is no significant difference here more there but there is definitely a big difference here but there's a broken axis here with uh, 800 international units for the exposed specimens and about 50 ish uh, for the unexposed specimens and that's with a low intensity uh, uh, uvb lamp black sword fly larvae had a fairly large uh, very high vitamin d content on the control diet, which contained vitamin D, of course, um, but that was not really altered by the uh, provision of UVB, indicating that this species might actually not be producing any vitamin D when it is subjected to UVB treatment. When looking at the 
uh, a higher intensity, then you find differences also for the migratory locusts and for the house crickets. So indeed, they also synthesize vitamin D, uh, but it uh, needs quite some intensity in order to be uh, uh, detected and to make a real difference. For the yellow mealworms, this is uh, the, the, well, it's the same image more or less, but we are still at the 50 here, but actually this axis is uh, far higher. So a higher intensity leads to a higher vitamin D content. And I can tell you that 3000 international units per kilogram, that's a lot, that's really a lot. And consistently with the previous uh, panel, black soldier fly larvae also with a higher uh, uh, intensity, no differences in vitamin D content. So species specific differences are uh, clear. And also the amount of radiation you provide to, uh, determines the amount of vitamin D being formed. Part of the same study was looking at uh, the, uh, the formation rate. So how quickly is this vitamin D uh, formed? And then you can see very small irradiation times and then extending one day of eight hours, another day of eight hours, another day of eight hours, and then you can really see it stabilizing here. So after uh, uh, eight days of uh, eight hours of radiation, it is more or less the same as after four days. So no big difference here, but in the beginning, just a little bit, and just these eight hours make a very big difference in vitamin D content um, for these yellow mealworms. So you can actually tailor the vitamin D uh, content to what you would want to have in the diet of the insectivore, the amphibian in this case. Okay, um, calcium. Yeah, a few things have been uh, said about that. Uh, calcium and vitamin D, of course, interact a bit. Vitamin D helps in the uh, the uptake of the uh, vitamin D uh, of the the calcium and the formation of bones and some more things. Some people are late coming in. Um, there are a few high calcium species out there, isopods, not insects, but I needed to mention them anyway, are clearly fairly high in calcium. Black spodifi larvae can be, but it's very dependent on the diet they are uh, provided with. Um, and then there's another fly species which is not commonly available that also is fairly high in calcium. Normally, a calcium to phosphorus ratio of 0.2, more or less, is what you would expect to find in most uh, insects. And I know that uh, there seems to be more or less consensus that uh, calcium uh, uh, concentration of, uh, uh, or ratio of two to one uh, with phosphorus would be the best. But I'm very curious to, to know how they would attain that if they do not have access to these few species that have so much, uh, have a far higher calcium to phosphorus ratio. Um, I'm not sure if it might have to do with the vitamin D state, uh, uh, status of the insectivores, so they can more selectively accumulate it. If they, have an, uh, if they all have an external uh, source of calcium, but it's a little bit odd looking at the calcium to phosphorus ratio that you would find in actually all uh, insects. Of course, certain uh, amphibians can take up the uh, calcium also in different ways. So can, they can take it up, uh, for instance, via the gills, which can be up to 70%. So as uh, tadpoles, there is definitely a different way also to attain sufficient calcium. Uh, as adults, I'm not so sure how much is normally taken up from the environment. I do understand that uh, uh, they can look for certain places which are higher in calcium and would therefore be able to attain some, but which percentage of their calcium requirements can be met in this way is unclear. Gut load diets can definitely be utilized in insects to alter the calcium to phosphorus ratio. So as long as we are still puzzling uh, why it works better if, the, if you change the uh, composition. Um, there is a reason to, uh, uh, to do so, and including some calcium in the diet of the insects uh, two to three days before feeding them off 
is a, a useful approach. Okay, a few more uh, uh, risks that I want to mention, at least, if you look at insects. Um, insects can introduce new pest species. So if you are trying to uh, uh, enter some uh, fruit flies into a, a, a as, as feed, you might also be introducing some mites, which for some amphibians might actually be a good source of uh, nutrients. But in certain cases, you do not want to have mites in your rearing or in your rearings. Heavy metals can accumulate, but uh, accumulation uh, patterns in insects are very, very different between species. So if you have uh, cadmium in the uh, uh, environment, black solidified larvae will uh, accumulate that strongly. Mealworms will not. If you have arsenic uh, in the environment, this will be strongly accumulated in the mealworms, but not in black solidified larvae. So the risks are very species specific there. Um, interesting fact, um, I read some Drosophila, as I said before, at the St. Louis Zoo, and I did that on the same diet uh, as used by other authors. I compared the composition, everything was very, very similar, except iron content. My iron content was far higher, so everything was the same, diet was the same, um, protein, etc., except for the iron. The iron was actually uh, something that I use to uh, make uh, a place for the uh, adults to sit on. So they uh, took up this iron, or it was on the outside of them, but you could definitely find that back uh, when feeding them off. A similar story, I had some aluminum cages in which I reared migratory locusts, did a, uh, an analysis on them, and indeed, as you would expect from the story so far, Aluminum was uh, uh, fairly high in uh, the samples that I provided because they were reared in such cages. So what you introduce in the rearing system is something that also can affect the, uh, the composition of the insects. Pesticides, of course, are, tend to uh, accumulate quite strongly in insects, but you might expect that to be uh, shown by the, the productivity of the insect colony itself. So that does not necessarily need to be a, a, a large surprise there. Um, mycotoxins do not seem to be a big problem for insects themselves. So if you, uh, for instance, have the black soldier fly, then you can provide them uh, with feed that is contaminated with mycotoxins. They will de detoxify it. But of course, if they eat diets uh, contaminated with mycotoxins, then you are actually gut loading them with these mycotoxins and that can function as a Trojan horse, but then you are feeding the mycotoxins to the uh, animal consuming them. So that's something you might want to be aware of. I'm not sure of the uh, how detrimental these mycotoxins are to amphibians. Perhaps they are also able to deal with that quite well, just as certain insect species can, uh, but it's something to think about. So take home messages. There are many insect species and all stories are different and all compositions are different. They have a uh, variation and uh, within, uh, within their, uh, their own composition and by giving a variable group of uh, insects to the animals that you're trying to feed, you can also allow some compensation in their nutrient intake. So if by uh, giving 10 species of insects, uh, you might be able to uh, allow some form of uh, self-selection. Providing just one species makes it difficult to get a, a decent diet. Combinations of species and diets are leading for the composition. So if you have a certain species and you have a certain diet and you keep all things the same, then you have a predictable outcome. So if you ask a company uh, how they produce their insects and if they have uh, done some analysis uh, on them, they might be able to tell you what you could expect to find there. If they change the diet in the meanwhile, then the data provided is no more than an indication. Um, coming back to the start of this, uh, this story, mind the usual suspects. So the uh, omega-3 fatty acids are uh, important, vitamin A and carotenoids, vitamin D, vitamin E, um, calcium, of course, uh, make sure that uh, there are different ways for the 
amphibians to uh, come across these nutrients and that the insects that you are uh, providing uh, have sufficient of these. Coming to the conclusion, I want to thank Mark Finke for the beautiful uh, uh, sheets that he shared with me. And I thank the chair groups of animal nutrition and entomology of my university of, uh, well, paying me to do this really interesting stuff. Thank you all.